thank you so much. So Richard, thank you so much for joining us. This is, this is a huge treat for, for me. Um, I'm not sure if anyone here watches HBO shows on a regular basis. I'm I guessing. Would, would, I'm leaving if that's not the case. <laughs> I'm guessing everyone here has seen the trailer for Game of Thrones. They're, they can't wait to see what happens. So let me ask, you, you came in, you became co-president of HBO in 2007. You were, became CEO in 2010. 2012. I'm sorry, 2012. When you con when you're made co-president in 2007, that was the year that Sopranos ended. There's a there's a huge, a huge wellspring of that HBO has recreated the television, the television marketplace, the television experience, and you're handed the company just as your biggest hit has ended, and you essentially have to kind of rebuild what was there. Tell me about what that was like. So, there were there were several problems, right? Not only was our biggest show going off the air, but we had made a couple of bad bets uh, on shows you may or may not remember, John from Cincinnati uh, and others, which had kind of, shall we say, not raised the bar uh, in, in terms of HBO standards. And I think I was in my job, my co-president job, maybe for 10 days, and one of the great New York Times reporters and, and somebody uh, for whom I have enormous respect, Bill Carter, called me up and said, listen, he said, you guys are, you guys are off your game, and uh, you know, I'm gonna, I got to do a piece trying to wrestle to the ground what's happened. And I said, geez, Bill, could you give me, gi give me six months? And if we haven't made any progress in six months, I got to do the piece now. And... <laughs> I'd say maybe it was maybe it was the worst piece that's ever been done <laughs> on the company on the front page of the business section of my favorite newspaper and the headline was HBO's competitors say they've stumbled and just to add insult to injury with the worst picture of me possible <laughs> in the upper uh, right right hand corner now the the piece stung um, for for three reasons you know number one it was in my favorite newspaper that um, I've read religiously since I'm 14 years old. Number two, it was written by someone for whom I had a lot of regard and respect and was uh, really the, um, uh, the ultimate um, uh, television uh, reporter and entertainment reporter. And number three, it was true. Um, we, we had stumbled. And I think the reason for that is uh, upon uh, uh, just a little bit of analysis, uh, when I came in, I did an audit, and I went around the creative community, and I talked to agents, and uh, I talked to producers. I talked to the real artists who do the real work of bringing magic uh, to HBO. And what I heard was what I suspected, which is that people thought uh, a little bit of hubris had set into our place, um, a little bit of arrogance, and that we knew what was best. And I can tell you that if we have the best idea in the room when we're talking with Creative Voice, we got a problem. Mm -hmm. Because what you want is somebody who breathes an idea, who has a real vision for what they want to do. When they're coming into the room and it is oozing out of them and you can feel it, and that's the bet you want to make. So I think our culture, um, having had the success that we did, we had run what I called uh, a, a great insurgent campaign from the mid-1990s into the early 2000s. We kind of got elected to the top of the firmament in the entertainment industry. We liked it there, and then in my judgment, what happened was we played to stay there, and we forgot the very voice that brought us to That's the game in the first place. And my job, uh, in uh, beginning in the summer of 2007, with my colleagues and our team, was in reviving that insurgent spirit and in recapturing the very uh, essence of our DNA, uh, which had made The Sopranos possible, and made The Wire possible, and made Sex in the City possible, uh, and Band of Brothers, uh, and, and, and all the Six Feet Under, and all the great so how do you have That was the mission. How do you have that conversation? You come in and you say, look guys, you have a string of hits behind you. HBO is famously has a, a loyal, stable base of employees and executives who have been with the company for a long time. How do you say to them, I think all of you guys are yeah. acting like arrogant jerks, and we need to refocus. Well, I, I didn't do it that way. <laughs> but That's what, not the key. What I did do, um, 
is I, I, I assembled a bunch of small groups and um, I, I, I organized uh, a basic theory of the case, which was the truth, that um, we had somehow stopped behaving um, in a way that showed proper reverence and respect for the talent. We, the cockiness was being worn a little bit on the sleeves of too many people. Phone calls weren't being returned. We had, in my judgment, we had lost our manners a little bit. Huh. And that was a big deal because we had had a lot of goodwill. And I assembled a bunch of groups and I said that. And, uh, you know, we moved a few people out who, who um, I thought were too uh, ossified in, in, um, uh, in, in old thinking. And we opened up the windows a little bit and we kind of took the beware of dog sign, you know, off the front and put welcome to our house. And, and we, we leaned into the community and no surprise um, because we're a bit of an oasis for many reasons in the creative world. Uh, as we opened the windows and as our attitude returned to what I think is our essential um, uh, ethos, uh, which is talent is sacred. When that happened, everything started to flow again. And, and I don't think it's any great accident that in came the Lena Dunhams and in came Alan Ball and in came Benioff and Weiss and uh, Mando Iannucci with Veep and Mike Judge with Silicon Valley. And, uh, everything, everything returned to its, its proper level. But we had to confront it, had to admit it was true. And my predecessor, who was a wonderful uh, man, and I went to him and I said, look, I'm going to go around the company um, and I'm going to speak the truth to the company about what I think happened. Uh, are you all right with that? Because you're going to hear about it. And everybody's not going to like it. But I think unless we stare it in the face and beat it down and return to who we are, we're in trouble. And we don't have a lot of time. Because once a negative halo gets on top of a company, um, it's very hard to shake it off. And um, uh, that, that was beginning to burgeon a little bit. That's interesting. Yeah. Let me, so how do you, it, one of the things that, that we've talked about. But excuse me, oh, it sure. turned around remarkably quickly. Really? Yeah. Hey, how long did that take? What, what was the, from start to finish, well, I think like we got there? In the community, I started to hear the results of it uh, very quickly, within within a couple of months, huh. um, and uh, people could feel it uh, that that we were much more responsive. We were taking meetings. We were saying no politely because saying no is in our business is as important as how you say yes because you want that talent coming back in the room. You want that talent visiting you again, thinking even if something got turned down. I'm going to come back with something else for HBO. What you don't want is people leaving and saying they they were rude, and I'm never I'm never going back there again. So how do you? you I, we've talked a little bit about that moment when you come in. I mean, one of the interesting things is you'd been with HBO for a while. You, you're promoted from within first to co-president, then as as CEO. We know that the power that leaders can say all types of things, right? Yeah. But it's really about what you do. What I are there a couple of things that you did to try and model exactly the attitude and the turnaround that you want to see, this, this kind of rejection of an arrogance? Yeah. Um, I think people understood, first of all, I, kn I had been there already for most of my uh, adult life, you know, since I was in, in my early 30s, and I had a lot of relationships across the company. People knew how much I loved the company. Um, I reflected, I think, um, every day in whatever position I had um, that HBO stood for excellence and differentiation and quality. And uh, I had relationships on all different sides of the company. Uh, I had a kind of unusual position before I was co-president, which was this EVP of HBO. And so I, f I floated a little bit between the business side and the creative side and the marketing side. Uh, so I had a lot of relationships and I think trust and goodwill. And I opened up the conversation. The biggest thing we did is we opened up the conversation. And uh, I'll tell you, th th this is a case study. So Girls, which became a phenomenon um, on the network, of course, was created by Lena Dunham when she was 24, 25 years old. Girls was, was discovered um, by a 22-year-old HBO executive who was at South by Southwest um, and uh, saw Lena's little experimental movie called Tiny Furniture. And she grabbed the cassette 
brought it back to LA. Copies were made and sent around to the three of us who were decision makers at the time. And we all watched it. And um, this young woman said to the team, I think this girl is reflective of something very, very unique about my generation. And I think she's got a real voice. And um, Kathleen is the person who found it huh. and brought it in. And we were just smart enough to say, you're right, and commissioned a script. And Lena wrote a script. And um, um, the rest kind of is history because Lena in Girls became a part of a panoply of creative work that came to redefine uh, the network. And the notion that a 22-year-old felt comfortable enough to come running back into the LA office uh, brandishing a, a DVD and saying, I have something here. And the culture allowed for her to do that comfortably, yeah. I think reflects the transformation uh, of what happened to us. Well, and, and I want to ask about that because I want to ask about how you create a tolerance for failure, right? Because I'm imagining at some point someone comes in and they say, Richard, you guys have got a couple great shows. You're, 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 you're becoming HBO again. I just want to say one word, dragons. You should definitely do dragons. Yeah. Th this seems like the, the most unlikely pitch. It, but how, oh, do you, how do you yeah. create a culture oh. where, where people feel like, I can take this risk, and I might fail, and that's OK? So another, another case study. So I was very nervous after I read the pilot script of Thrones because I was concerned that it was a little bit off brand. We had never done sci-fi in any form. I was worried that it was out there. It was very expensive. The BBC had dropped out. Um, they were going to co-finance the pilot, so it meant that the whole uh, cost burden was on us. And Carolyn Strauss, who used to work at HBO, who was one of the producers of the show, called me up. And she just had an instinct that uh, A, I was nervous about it, but B, that I was open enough to take a meeting. And she said, I need you to sit with David Benioff. And um, I said, OK, my pleasure. And Benioff came in, and he confronted it head on. And he said, look, I understand you're a little concerned. You think it's a little off brand. I said, I do. And he said, well, let me, let me try to allay your concern. He said, number one, you're a political junkie, right? And I said, I am. And he said, all this is is archetypal power. That's all this is, a story of power. Number two, you'll forget where you are in the first 15 minutes. Uh, you could be in 10th century England. You could be in 5th century. So you'll just forget where you are. And then he looked at me and he said, I have wrestled with this for the last two years. I understand it. I feel it. I breathe it. There are very few things in my life that I would devote the next 8 to 10 years to. This is one of them. And I won't let you down. And I... I, it was it was over, and, you know. He, he, he had, now, interestingly, he he uh, he tells another story about he he invoked his dad, who's a, a very well known uh, investment banker and who had been uh, in politics. And um, he said, you know, my father, uh, like you, very involved with the Council on Foreign Relations, like you, very involved in politics, and he thought this was crazy. And then he read all the books and he became obsessed. So after last year's premiere in San Francisco. I said, Steve, you know, your father's name is Steve Friedman. I said, you're one of the reasons that I became, what are you talking about? And David was coming out of the aisle, and there were hundreds and hundreds of people in San Francisco at the premiere. And I said, well, when, when David said to me that you were hooked, that meant a lot to me. The father said, I read the first 30 pages of the book. <laughs> and David said, so a good story beats. <laughs> and David, David just turned around and said, Dad. Enough. I said, well, listen, <laughs> thank God, thank God we parsed slightly on the story. But anyway, the, 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 the fundamental point about Thrones is that Carolyn felt this is not dead. Let's, let's open up the conversation. And David felt, you know, that he had a real story to tell. And frankly, um, my colleague Mike Lombardo had a similar conversation with Dan Weiss, his partner that occurred in, um, in the gym where he, he, he saw Dan Weiss's passion. And so, for us, it wasn't even that hard of a bet because we believed in them, and uh, we, we couldn't have been more right. That's interesting. And, and let me ask about the process a little bit, because I know one of the things that you've done is you've created the B team, right? You, you, Indies, yeah. You, you, you explicitly have people who are going to be challenging, are going to be working on 
ideas that might actually contradict completely what you're doing. How do you do that? How do you create a safe space and what's the benefit of that? Well, the benefit is twofold. Number one, um, you should always have, you know, what Lincoln called the wisdom of uncertainty, you know, in inside um, the senior ranks of, of your company because uh, the velocity of change is such that A, you could be wrong and B, you could miss something. So to have a bunch of talent, particularly um, of a different generation, thinking originally about problems without the burden of implementing day-to-day -day work, liberated in effect to think freely and to challenge conventional wisdom, knowing that they will be rewarded one way or the other, right? So even if, if it doesn't if, come to pass, if they have a Promethean idea and they come in and they say, look, here's, here's the new way to the North Star, fantastic, but they might just refine um, a current way of thinking. And if that's true, that's helpful. But on two, three fundamental occasions in the last two, three years, we pulled out a Team B uh, white paper uh, when we were ready to make a decision. And that Team B white paper ended up informing our thinking, undergirded by research. Uh, a lot of thought had gone into it. And the great uh, 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 corollary effect is the, the young folks in your company realize that it's not a cosmetic exercise, right. that the leadership of the company is not only paying attention to it, but your work ultimately could become policy. It's, it's literally like a young analyst at the CIA knowing that the president may see his work in the president's daily brief, and that changes the esprit de corps inside an organization. Everybody gets excited, and people understand that there's not ossified thinking at the top of the company, which is uh, very liberating for your culture. H it, what are the rules of getting a Team B to work? Are you actually taking this group and you're saying, senior executives can't be on that group, you have to go into a room? W yeah. What makes so it So we set up a, th uh, a, a kind of, not my direct reports, but a group of quite senior uh, executives from across different disciplines called the Business Development Council, which is um, you know, kind of a cabinet, if you will, for the Team Bs. And if we have a problem that we know is incoming or a problem that we suspect may be emerging, or we're quite frankly not sure about how something is gonna move in the coming years, we'll say, let's look at a Team B on it. Hmm. And let's see what happens. So for example, one of the first things we did, uh, but even before we made the decision to design a standalone streaming service, should we monetize our content by selling it uh, outside of our ecosystem? Big question, right? Yeah. I, is there any diminution of the value of the subscription if people can get HBO content somewhere else? And we made a decision that is long, but then this was uh, a, a huge, huge conversation because we knew that within 18 months to two years, we were gonna have, by, by the way, not only a digital product with HBO Go that was gonna be growing, but a standalone streaming service that was gonna be growing. But we decided after a lot of thinking, and the Team B deserves a lot of the credit, that the real line in the sand was three years. So that if we, if we sold three-year-old product, say, to Amazon, and monetized that product, it did two things. It gave people outside our ecosystem a chance to sample some of our work that they that may not have seen it. We learned that something like 75% of people who had Amazon Prime had not really seen HBO shows. Huh. And we knew that three years was basically the right uh, measure of where somebody was gonna say, it's not enough for me not to subscribe just because I've seen it. In fact, it could be titillating. It could drive me to the network. And so, when we decided to entertain that question, which was worth um, a lot of revenue to us, we had already done a lot of research and thinking on it. The Team Bs had, the Business Development Council had, and so by the time it got to my office, um, people were very liberated to think out loud. That was, prior to that, a marginal line which had not been crossed. That's interesting. Yeah. And, and, and I wanna open it up to questions. Let me ask one more, one more before, before I do. Talking about big bets, I, I, you know, you guys have made a number of big bets. You, HBO Now, HBO Go. You're you're challenging the structure of how television works. I know that there's from the, the cable carriers that there's some pushback. I imagine if I'm working at HBO, I've been there for a while, and thinking to myself, this is a huge bet that my future is dependent on getting this right. How do you deal with the anxiety that comes from ultimately you as the decision maker deciding, yeah, we're going to move forward and we're going to take this risk. 
I think that if you create, if your culture is really transparent and you have really allowed a full and unfettered debate to take place, you know, the cliche, everybody knows everything is true inside a company. And m my variation of that theme is the building knows the truth, by which I mean if we have a show or an idea and we've rationalized it, you can't fake out anybody in either Santa Monica or in LA. They know it's a B and they know that it, it, it hasn't risen to the level that we want. Conversely, if we do something special um, and you know we grab Bill Simmons or, or we create Vice News or we bring Jon Stewart to the network, you can feel the energy. Everybody yeah. knows the truth. And so when you've had an unfettered conversation inside your company, it is a much more, um, uh, it is a much more comfortable position from which to make a bold decision. Because when you go around the room and you take a kind of final vote, which I did on HBO Now, you're never gonna get a hundred nothing vote in the Senate, but if you get a 90-10 vote, you know after a great deal of thinking and conversation, you know, w Winston's great line, the governor is to choose. It's much better to choose when you've had a lot of input, and then, um, you know, that's the business we've chosen. Yeah. You have to make those bets. Let, let me go to the audience, for uh, our colleagues, for, for questions. Um, feel free to, to raise your hand, if, uh, and if you don't mind just sharing. Yes, over here. I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania. I'm John Zismills from Salesforce, by the way. I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania on Public Square. There's a plaque there. It says, the birthplace of HBO. And I just feel uh, super responsible for your success in the whole <laughs> network <laughs> since we embraced take, take it. And all I'm a huge fan. And I just wanted to put that out because I've never been able to use that anywhere in life. <laughs> it's and a credential. It's the first place I could stand up and say. It's a credential that <laughs> should allow us to give you free subscription for the rest of your life. <laughs> I, I gladly pay for HBO. It's the greatest network ever. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> great question. It's a great, great question. question. Those are the questions that. If only the stock analysts ask questions exactly. just like that. Great question. Does any, any, anyone else? Um, oh, yeah, right here. Composition of your Team B. Sorry, I'm Paula Daly from NBC Partners. Um, who, who's in that group of Team B, and how, do, how long do they stay in that team? Good question. Uh, the, the Team Bs are formed with a little bit of input from HR and a little bit of input from the senior management who believes that the insights coming from that particular individual or that particular department will help inform the right decision. So when we were gonna, you know, remember, when we made the decision that we were gonna build a standalone streaming service, there were many bigs on us when I announced it at Investor Day um, in October 2014. The first dig came when, when the three CEOs and Jeff Bugis, we were up on stage, the first dig came from an analyst who said, can you do this? You're not a tech, you're not a tech company, you're not Netflix, you're not Amazon, can you do this? And it was a legitimate question because we had to improvise, partner, hire, create uh, an entire new dimension of talent inside our company in Seattle and in New York just to be able to play in this league. It was a huge, huge run. But because the Team Bs had done good, solid thinking on this, we already had a plan in place um, of who we needed, how we could scale up, who our potential partners out there could be to help us with our back end. We chose MLB Advanced Media, which was a brilliant bet on our part. Um, and a lot of work had been done. But the folks who informed that came out of the fledgling technology uh, area inside HBO, came out of marketing. Some of them actually came out even of the HR department because they just knew where a lot of talent um, existed. So it's informed by senior executives, it's informed by HR, we look at it all the time. Second part of your question is important. We also rotate people out. So if somebody has a particular skill on the creative side, we want them in a different team B than somebody who has a particular skill, for example, on contemporary marketing and social media. But we move them around a lot, we think about it all the time, and people love it, 
They love going both to the Business Development Council and the Team Bs because they know it's real. I want to ask one, one last question. Um, You've talked to me about personal time allocation, right? There's a, you have to be very conscious about how you spend your time. You, you've, you've spoken to me about very deliberately deciding what's pass-fail this week and what you got to get right. an A-plus on. How do you think about that if we're looking at you week by week? Um, I run every night, and um, every night on my run, I try to synthesize Haley Barber's you know, Haley Barber, the great philosopher, former governor of <laughs> Mississippi, head of the Republican Party, is a great line. He said, said to me one time, he said, Richard, the main thing is keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> and, and, I, and so what I try to do when I'm running is keep the main thing the main thing. And uh, identify, it, it really maybe is the most important thing I, I do every week, every month, every quarter. What are the two, three main things? And um, as anybody in my chair finds, the main thing may change. And so you have to be dexterous enough in your organization, flexible enough, um, because your inbox may not be the inbox that you plan uh, when, you, when you're defining uh, what the main thing is. But right now, for example, I, I have two, three things that are our priorities, both on the creative side and on the business side. I think about that all the time. All of my other direct report meetings for the next two, three weeks are pass-fail. Um, even if something is important, it's pass-fail for the next two weeks because if you take, there's only so much bandwidth in, in any government, in any company, and in any CEO's life, right? And if you fill that bandwidth the wrong way, um, you're going to focus on the wrong things and you're not going to make the best contribution you can to your company. Richard. Time, very important. Are we done? I, I, Before we're done. I, yeah, oh yeah. Before we're done, I have, to, <laughs> I have to give you something. So I hope we have Game of Thrones watchers. So there's House of Stark, right. right? You know, there's House of Lannister. And if you guys don't say anything, because we're off the record and this is family, in the new season uh, of Thrones, we now have the new <laughs> House <laughs> of Uh which is, which is for you. Thank you very much. You're very Richard Flepper, thank, thank you for you. joining us. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>